forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Jesus said, the first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Hear the commandments of God to his people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not make for yourself any idol. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not invoke with malice the name of the Lord your God. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Honor your father and your mother. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not commit murder. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not commit adultery. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not steal. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not be a false witness. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God has mercy on you, forgives you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthens you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keeps you in eternal life. no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Sorry. <laughs> we know that Ben has no power over the pedals of the organ. <laughs> Keep us outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us be seated. The first lesson is from the book of Exodus, chapter 20. A reading from Exodus. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, 
but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day, the Sabbath day, and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. 
The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, the stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. The Passover was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you'll raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture 
and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to the Christ. from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. This is the time of year when the sweet gum tree drops its spiky seed pods. In the mid-1940s, Dutch elm disease spread across the mid-Atlantic, wiping out tree-lined streets even as far into the Midwest. And in response, the Arbor Day Foundation handed out saplings to plant elm replacements along the sidewalks. And they failed to consider the consequences. The sweet gum has essentially disappeared from nearly every plant and nursery catalog and now regularly appears on the worst trees to plant in your yard lists. And I know this from experience. Multiple neighbors of ours have sweet gum planted in their yard and this time of year, those spiky seed pods litter our yards, gardens, sidewalks, and street, so that as I'm shuttling my daughters to the car in the morning for school, we go from a very brisk trot out the door and then move to a careful tiptoe, lest we slip on those spiky balls. I curse the sweet gum tree, much like Jesus cursed the fig tree just before today's gospel reading. Though rather than shriveling, under the weight of my curse, it just keeps dropping more problems in my path. One neighbor aptly calls those spiky balls ankle breakers. They have the capacity to slow me down and hold me up, lest together with my children we stumble and fall flat on our faces. Now, this last January, when I was in London on a continuing education trip, I had the unfortunate experience of indeed falling splat on the sidewalk. Having exited the train and locating the guest house, I was marching energetically down the sidewalk with my suitcase in tow, looking at these beautiful British row houses, the central part green. There's this church off in the distance, and then summarily stumbled on the uneven walk, earning my first bloodied knees and skinned hands in memory. Gathering my ego, I began to stand, though unbeknownst to me, men in a construction truck had pulled over, having seen the event, and hopped out to offer me a steady hand. And the stranger was indeed a welcome sight in a moment of real embarrassment and offered me a Band-Aid. <laughs> there are two ways to negotiate fall risks when walking. The first, of course, is to indeed stumble, maybe fall, and discover what happens when you try to stand up which I would qualify as things done. The other way is avoidance, like tiptoeing through that maze of spiky seed balls on the sidewalk, which is the equivalent of things left undone. Paul knows this. He writes about these risks in his letter to that church in Corinth. 
He writes, quote, the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Now, to be clear, Paul himself is a Jew, and he has studied with Gentiles, non-Jews, as a Roman citizen. So when he writes these things, he's not speaking pejoratively to or about Jews or Greeks or Gentiles. Rather, he is raising up Jews and Gentiles as an example of what happens when any religious or educated or powerful person along with the hoi polloi hear about Jesus Christ's cross and what it might have to do with them. Christian faith is indeed marked by a cross, which is a stumbling block for anybody who looks for anything else to satisfy their search for God. The cross is a stumbling block not just for people out there, but for us who tend to fear, love, and trust things other than God above anything else. Like our reading from the Hebrew scripture last week when we found Abraham falling flat on his face in front of God who was busy making startling promises, telling Abraham that he was about to get land and children and blessed to be a blessing to the great wide world, Paul says that we should expect similarly when we encounter the cross. We stumble and trip over it and tend to find our face on the ground. And we're surprised at what happens when we rise up on the other side wondering what on earth just happened. The cross is a stumbling block for us and for the many people who came before us because it prompts the same questions that Paul's contemporaries were asking, oftentimes by rolling their eyes and through gritted teeth, wondering, what on earth does this bizarro instrument of ancient Roman capital punishment have to do with me? Well, the answer to that is this. The cross of Jesus Christ announces the lengths to which God will go to bring life into the world in raising God's son through death and on the other side of death for life now and life into the world to come. And to say that that's not just a promise for Jesus, but that's a promise for you too. In other words, the cross announces hope despite everything that threatens to harm in this old world. That God's yes always gives life over the loudest no that we're always hearing all around us. You may have noticed that during Lent, we're beginning our confession with the words, I confess that I am captive to sin and cannot free myself. It's helpful to begin by saying something true about our circumstances before saying something true about the behaviors that follow downstream from our circumstances. We begin the Ten Commandments with the first, which is, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. The truth is, we would each prefer to be our own Lord and Master, captive to the idea that, if given the chance, we could really run things better. The ways that we seek to impose our own will on the world is what rolls out in, which, in what we leave done and undone. In this way, our relationship with God and with God's people and God's creation becomes distorted and mismanaged and often bears the marks of destruction. <clears throat> Our attention is either grabbed by carefully tiptoeing around the cross that suggests might, that God might have a different direction for our lives rather than our own preferred way forward. Or if we stumble on the cross, getting up to see what's changed, we simply remain slayed, splayed on the ground, wondering why God would choose such a strange and uncomfortable stumbling block to send us out with surprising new life. Jesus' cross is a stumbling block because it sets out to change everything we thought we knew about ourselves and our world, the places we thought we'd go and what we thought we might do. Jesus' cross tells us that God's plan is to interrupt our regularly scheduled captivity to self-interest and open us wide by faith to the needs, interests, ideas, welfare, and life of our neighbors as ourselves. To put an explanatory spin on that line from the gospel we heard, zeal for you will consume me, says the Lord, being as you are also God's temple, God's dwelling place, where God wants to be. <coughs> when I fell on that sidewalk in London in January, I said aloud first, oh, and then, ow. 
And I think it's not much different when you find yourself crumpled after tripping over the stumbling block that is Jesus Christ and his cross. The O oh comes when you realize that God is using your great talents and interests as they intersect with the world's deepest needs, pulling you out of your own self-interest. The OW comes when you say, I don't know if I want to do that. To which God says, yes, I understand. And I will be with you, making faith in life in, with, through, and for you. I'll conclude today with another story about London and the days that followed my face-to-face -face meeting with that London pavement. The first Sunday I was there, I attended three separate worship services, a veritable church of Palooza. The very first church I attended was St. George in the East, where they offer what they call high Anglo-Catholic style worship in the neighborhood right in the midst of this growing, diverse congregation where they're actively helping build up a neighborhood still suffering from the building and repair costs of World War II bombing while finding ways to serve the steady influx of refugees that are local to them. When they said Anglo-Catholic worship, I'd expected something at least more like what we do here at Redeemer. I expected, particularly being in England, maybe some more smells and bells, but it turns out that it was a service that I would find interchangeable with just about any Midwestern Lutheran service that tends to have a more congregational feel to it. We went from there to Westminster Abbey for Evensong, which was indeed very high Anglo-Catholic. The children in their cute ruffled church robes singing the songs of men buried in the floors of that church with pitch perfection, the liturgy and associated pageantry offered with military precision, and then finally, at the end of the evening, we landed at a place called Holy Trinity in a London neighborhood called Brompton. A hollowed out, hallowed Anglican church with plaques from earlier centuries. They had built a stage up where the nave is, where they had a hit band who led us in at least 30 plus minutes of energetic praise music, people flinging their hands wide in prayer and emotion. There were people crying on the floor. There was a veritable altar call to pray with teams of people up front to receive worshipers. And there was an invitation to join and find a place to serve and to be served. A neighborhood church, a high Anglo-Catholic service, and a charismatic praise service that bears analogy to the American non-denominational worship experience. Each had well over 100 people in attendance. Each one visibly diverse in every way you might imagine, from people to style. Many individual churches having made very different decisions about major social issues. Yet every single one of those churches is part of the Church of England in the Diocese of London. I found that it was a day full of both liturgical and ecclesial whiplash. The following day, we enjoyed an audience with the sitting Bishop of London, Sarah Mulally, the first female bishop since the beginning in the year 314 with Bishop Restitutus. <laughs> and we asked her about the vast diversity of worship styles that we witnessed, given how often I see here in the US, the Episcopal Church wants to be fairly rigid in its expression. How could it be that they all remain united in this one church body, the Church of England? After all, in America, disagreements usually bring cancellation and schism and more than attempts at goodwill. Don't like what we're up to? Fine, we'll take our business elsewhere. Bishop Mulally said in her very kind and gentle British tone, with her cup of tea, with her pinky up. <laughs> she said, you have seen the stumbling blocks that we have faced. These churches indeed are all quite different. Yet when Holy Trinity Brompton experienced a kind of charismatic spiritual awakening a few decades back, they went to the then London Bishop, a rather stern high Anglo-Catholic man, and asked his blessing on their sense that God was calling them to this new way forward that would indeed look very different than any other Church of England settings. The Bishop was suspect and indeed hesitant. He said he wasn't so sure that that was going to work. Thank you very much. The clergy and lay people from Holy Trinity slowly returned 
except I think this is what God is calling us to, and we may have to move forward anyway. The bishop sighed and turned his head, and in his office, a portrait of John Wesley caught his eye. John Wesley of the 18th century, who was called to a similarly charismatic ministry from within the Church of England in his own time, and who was then summarily thrown out of the denomination against his wishes and will, which is how Methodists came to exist. The Bishop of London found that he had stumbled into and over the cross, which calls us to surprise and to do even difficult things in order to remain close in faith and move forward together in Jesus Christ, even though our expressions and practices might look different. And so rather than casting them out or censuring them or threatening them, he blessed the people at Holy Trinity, which began a movement that is causing disparate expressions of this same Christian church in London to not just remain united, but to grow like wildfire whether it's Holy Trinity in Brompton, whether it's Westminster Abbey, or whether it's St. George's in the East, these churches are growing in all of their vast, diverse expressions because they know that they are not in competition with each other, but rather they are serving communities in the name of Christ Jesus under the umbrella of this one unified faith. This is what it means for the cross to be a stumbling block. It trips us up and then raises us up to find ourselves in surprising unity. Jesus Christ makes the surprising, the unimaginable, actually possible. Jesus Christ, he call, Jesus Christ calls us here at Redeemer in all of our diversity and our differences of opinion together by faith to try on expressions of worship, to try on hymns, to try on what it means to serve our neighbor to try on what it means to be. It's the same cross that as you stumble over it, you're likely to land yourself in a pool of water with God calling you by name, child of God. It's the same cross that as you stumble over it, you're likely to trip onto this altar receiving bread and cup. It's the same cross that as you stumble over it, you're probably going to find yourself being served and then also serving some of the most unlikely people for the most unlikely reasons at the most unlikely times and places, saying, this is my life? Wow, God, thank you, but I didn't expect that. And it is the same cross that one day when you find yourself having finally stumbled over into a grave, one day you will wake up and find your Lord and God holding out a hand to say, stand up. It's time to get up and get about the business of life, just like my son Jesus did at Easter. Because the cross finally means that everything deadly and death-dealing in this world never gets the final word. Rather than spiky seeds and uneven, sidewalk, uh, and, and uneven sidewalks, stumble over the cross together with me this week. It's the cross that frees us from the captivity of ourselves for the sake of freedom and hope, that would be impossible without the gifts of God breaking in for us. And God will always put that freedom to work for good, not just for your sake, but for the sake of your neighbors through you. Join me in stumbling over into this gift of faith and into the new life that follows. Amen. Let's rise and declare our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God of God, life from light, true God from true God. He God did not make, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate for the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified by the conscious Pilate. He suffered death and he was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the Lord of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken in the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. your servants the peace that the world cannot give 
that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Let us share the peace. invite you to be seated for a few announcements. Of course, we want to welcome all of you who are visiting with us today. We're so glad to be here on this absolutely gorgeous day. I hope that you get a chance to take a walk maybe later on or have a cup of coffee with someone either new or that you live with uh, at maybe at one of the local coffee shops, of course, after our coffee hour. <laughs> so we want to welcome all of you and we're glad to be here in this space. We want to welcome also those who are worshiping with us from home. So if we can share the peace with those who are on camera, peace be with you as well. Just two brief announcements, I suppose three. First of all, Holy Week is indeed coming up. It's coming up a little sooner than I think anyone believes it's coming up. And so make sure that you're taking a look at this on your calendar. You'll be receiving more information in the upcoming week about Palm Sunday, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Vigil, and Easter Sunday. And we're excited to say that we have a baptism at the Easter Vigil. So please make sure that there's time in your schedule to participate. We have the East End Lenten series that is continuing. If you are interested in more information or would like to attend, there are these sheets at the very back of the church on the table as you depart that way. Redeemer is hosting the event on, on Tuesday evening, March 19th. We're going to be having a soup and cheese and bread dinner, and that's going to be followed by a church service here at 7 o'clock p.m. The dinner starts at 6. 7 o'clock p.m. Is the, is the service. Please also note that if you are unable for any reason to attend the 7 p.m. service, maybe you need to get children home to bed, or maybe you're just a little worried about driving as it gets dark, please come to the 6 p.m. dinner because this is also part of the fellowship that we share. It's not a problem if you're not able to attend the service afterwards. It's good for us to be together. And lastly, I have noticed that at the Mary Mag service, the 9.30 service where we lead uh, primarily a service for children, for families with, with younger children. There are opportunities that all of you have to participate insofar as that if any of you would like to consider doing the story, which is what essentially the sermon is for the Mary Mags group, you can use props, you can use all sorts of creative ways to tell the story. If you are interested in helping with that service, you could help with the story or you could help lead the prayers of the people. And so if that sounds like something that calls to you as an opportunity to serve, just know that there are plenty of opportunities for lay people to lead in this worship space, and we are glad to have you. And now, since it is the first Sunday of the month, we want to acknowledge birthdays and anniversaries. We missed one this morning. It turns out that Eleanor Lee turned five yesterday. 
And so if it's on your mind, please make a note to just send uh, her parents, Ian and Emma, a quick note that I'm sure they would be happy to share with Eleanor. Are there any other birthdays in March? John. Ann? Elizabeth will be next Friday. All right. Rose? Zach will be 33. Zach will be 33. Do I have people back here? Winter. Winter? How old is he? 10. Win t double digits. His son will be in the double digits. Brian. Excellent. And who, you're what, 20, 22, 23? And are there any anniversaries that are celebrated in March? James and Alan. Brilliant. Um, will those of you who have birthdays or anniversaries stand as you are able? so we can pray for you. Oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on these your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Happy birthday and happy anniversary. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts.
Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This cup, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. We celebrate, therefore together we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died, Christ, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food, and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joys of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now we pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us be the feast. God for the people of God. My Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. As though you have already come, I embrace you and unite myself entirely to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
Christ our Lord strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of your body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Usually when we hear that someone has stumbled, tripped, and fallen, we think about something that may cause injury, pain, or damage. Rather, when we encounter the stumbling block that is the cross of Jesus Christ, Expect to trip into the arms of one who will have you, hold you, love you, feed you, serve you, and care for you, and hold out a hand to make sure that you can stand upright on the other side. And so grant, most merciful Lord, to these your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins by the power of your holy absolution, and serve you with a quiet mind, through Jesus Christ our Lord.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yeah.